Hey there, everybody. I don't know why it just looks like the camera startled me. Um, I knew that it was going to happen. I knew this video was going to happen. Uh, this is kind of an impromptu video I didn't expect to make, but that's okay because it's still going to be awesome. This video uh, is going to really be fun because it's not only going to touch on, or this assignment that we do with it either, it's not only going to touch on government. It's also going to touch on the law. It's also going to touch on history. Those are like the three favorite subjects that you have, and I know that's true. So, um, this is about three Supreme Court cases, and they're three of the most important. Many other important Supreme Court cases. Supreme Court cases have influenced American history in a ton of different ways. You can read all about it. There's just some huge decisions that were incredibly important. Um, but these three happened during the early stages of our republic, and so they establish kind of how our government is going to work. So we're going to talk about those real quick. And just so you know, this video is only about the effects. Chances are we either talk in class or whatever assignment I have you doing, because I'll probably use this video year after year after year. Hello, students on jetpacks. Um, but chances are you're going to have to research or look up on your own or we'll talk in class about what actually happened in the case. I'm going to talk about why they're important, the big takeaways. This is a big takeaway video about... Um, why these things are important and maybe how they affect us today or you can use your own brain and figure out how they affect us today after I say it. So the first one is this case called Marbury versus Madison. In our Constitution, um, it's kind of unclear, well it's not super unclear, but it's very vague what the Supreme Court really does. It talks about some of the ways that cases can get there um, and then obviously the Founding Fathers would respect the rule of law and say, okay, courts are important, but they really thought of it as Congress and the President are always uh, kind of wrestling. The two houses of Congress are disagreeing on things, or the states and the federal government have a balance. They knew that courts were important. They believed that, uh, but they didn't necessarily think of the Supreme Court as an elevated co-equal, is the word we use, co-equal branch of the government. Um, that could limit the other two. Um, they didn't necessarily think that. So, when you get to Marbury versus Madison, a whole bunch of stuff happens that you'll read about. It's confusing. Try your best. Long story short, the court gives itself a power, which is fun. It gives itself a power. This thing called judicial review. Judicial review. Judicial review is the idea or the ability of the Supreme Court to declare laws and executive actions, things the president does, so laws passed by Congress, executive actions, things the president does, as unconstitutional. Not good or bad, not right or wrong, not moral or immoral, as unconstitutional. And if you declare something unconstitutional, if the Supreme Court says you can't do that, um, you are not supposed to do it. <laughs> okay, there might be some more wrestling that happens there as far as... Um, presidents and Congress not wanting to listen to what the Supreme Court says, but um, kind of where we stand nowadays, if the Supreme Court makes a decision, the government is probably going to follow it. Um, so that's Marbury versus Madison, and you're like, okay, so judicial review, that's interesting, whatever. That's the main thing our Supreme Court does now, like in modern times. Every other court case we'll ever talk about in this class, or that you'll talk about in high school, couldn't have happened or wouldn't have mattered, I guess, um, without Marbury versus Madison. So it's very important that the court gains this power that lets it into this system of checks and balances where we have three branches that can really block and stop each other. Because um, before, the main conflict was meant to kind of be between the two branches or even within the legislative branch or between the states and the federal government. Speaking of states and the federal government, oh my gosh, that was an awesome segue. Good job, Mr. Dunn. Uh, speaking, I'm sorry I did that, I really am, of segues and states in the federal government. The next case is something called McCullough versus Maryland. Uh, long story short, there was a bank. You'll learn all about it. And it was a national bank owned, run by, owned, partially owned, but mostly run by the federal government and did all sorts of important things for the federal government and economic things. And the state of Maryland was like, hey, you know what? You're a bank in our state. You're going to have to pay your taxes. You have to pay your taxes. And plus, you know, where does it even say in the Constitution that the government can set up a bank? It doesn't say anything about a bank. 
You even have a right to exist. Um, so this is going to set two important things, and neither of them really have much to do with a bank. Yeah, history's fun that way, isn't it? But this is going to set up two important things for our government. One, uh, the federal government is always going to be above the states. States can't tax federal things. States can't pass laws for federal things. Okay, like, and I'm talking institutions. If you are a senator, you can't go into another state and start stealing things. That's not what that means. You'll still get in trouble. Okay, but as far as federal institutions, they are going to be above state ones. And that makes sense. If you have an overarching authority to run all these things, it wouldn't make sense if the states could just stand up to it and then shrug it off. What's the point of having an overarching authority at that point? Um, so that's number one. Federal is going to be above state. It's solidified. It's been tested and the state lost. Um, they're going to keep testing. We'll learn about that all the way up until the Civil War. And in some ways now, but it's way different than the Civil War. The next thing is it gives Congress a ton of power with something called the Necessary and Proper Clause, a.k.a. the Elastic Clause. Elastic is stretchy, right? So this Necessary and Proper Clause says that Congress can pass laws that are necessary and proper to do whatever is listed in the Constitution. So that bank thing, not listed in the Constitution. But it's necessary and proper to fulfill other roles that the federal government has to do. The government has used this clause to do a ton of things. A ton, a ton, a ton of stuff that are not listed in our Constitution. So if you look at how big our government is, um, a big part of it is this elastic clause and how much power the government has. A big part of it is the elastic clause, a.k.a. the necessary and proper clause. Okay. Um, and then the last one, another fun one about federal power. There's a case called Gibbons v. Ogden. It has to do with steamboats. <laughs> okay, that's not really that funny, but I'm going to keep laughing about it. Um, so these are things that now it's like it's not even that important. Like what? We don't have steamboats and river commerce. Uh, but long story short, it set up this thing called interstate commerce. Interstate commerce was already happening. Interstate commerce just means you are trading or doing business over state lines. Okay, but what this does is it says the federal government can get involved and make laws about that. So anytime something crosses state lines to be sold or to be built into something that will be sold, the government has a right, the federal government has a right to get involved in its regulation. All right, so this is the kind of power that we talk about if we have to think about something like the FDA, um, getting involved in the safety of our food and our medicines, well, those things are going to cross state lines. You don't just sell chicken only in Montana. I don't know why I came up with that example, but you sell it all over, right? And most of the time, the chicken we eat isn't from Indiana, it's from some other place. So it's crossed state lines at some, time, at some point. So this doesn't necessarily seem like a huge deal just because in history we like to focus on like wars and political struggles and stuff like that. But... It is. If you look at everyday involvement of the government in life, whether it's taxes or regulation, the interstate commerce clause, and then that being beefed up by the Supreme Court case, supported by the Supreme Court case, Gibbons v. Ogden, is a huge, huge deal. Um, and, you know, it's not always good or bad. It could be either. But it's definitely constitutional. Because remember, judicial review, like at the beginning of the video, it's not whether it's good or bad. So whether the Constitution says you can do it. Um, so yeah, those are the three early Supreme Court cases that we cover in this class that really are going to set up um, how our government even functions in a lot of ways. Lots of other important Supreme Court cases throughout American history that have changed everyone's life, really. Um, and they still do that work today. So there's a lot to learn. But this is a start. This is a really good start. I hope you all at least tolerated this video, even if you didn't enjoy it. I'll catch you next time.